coming into order. Everybody, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Before we open up the, uh, the hearing on the hearing of the evidence um, and to Lieutenant Ryan Geyser, um, wanted to discuss some business of the safety board for the, the next administrative hearing. Yeah, his council has requested a con his council has requested a continuance. I've objected to it, so I would assume the board needs to rule on that now. This would be for Terry Mitchum. Yes. Okay. Um, Mitchum has a request of a continuance. The board needs to, our council has um, objected to that continuance. The board needs to rule on that. Mm -hmm. Is there a motion to the request to continue the hearing for Mitchum? Is there a reason that we have? Is he needs a continuance? It was stated in the motion. Uh, Gene, did you give that out? I don't know. I think I forwarded it to you. First. Okay. I don't think I did. May I respond? To that? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, members of the board, uh, I have been You're focusing. Members of the board, I have been focusing, of course, on preparation for this particular hearing. I am also counsel for the chief. There are very serious allegations involving the chief, and I need additional time in which to investigate potential witnesses, to prepare uh, evidence and exhibits. It's very time consuming and also it's challenging to try to talk to witnesses during the holiday season when many people are taking vacations or wanting to focus on their family celebrations rather than talking to lawyers with respect to what their testimony might be at a hearing. I have a very ill 97-year-old mother that needs my help very much so in Fort Wayne, and uh, that family obligation concerns me very much uh, at this particular point in time as well. It's, it's my first request for continuance. It's not being made for purposes of delay. It's just uh, because of my personal situation and the intricacies of the case uh, require more attention to it. Which client are taking first? Uh, Terry uh, Mitchell came first. So was your choice to represent Lieutenant Geyser after being obtained by Terry? Yes, sir. And now you feel inadequate to represent Terry? Feel prepared to represent Terry because you chose to take on a different client? No. Okay. So you would be prepared? Uh, I am prepared whenever you demand it, but I would ideally like additional time for the reasons that I indicated. I'm not trying to do this uh, without uh, a reason. Uh, I'm very close to my, my 97 year old mother, and she's very ill. Any other questions for the board? Tony, any response? Well, I'll simply indicate that uh, this particular hearing was set within, at the very end of the 30 day period that Mr. Braun has been. He's come to a couple of meetings on behalf of the chief. He knew what at least some of the allegations were going to be. And if he chose to represent someone else, and that caused him to be unable to prepare properly for Chief Mitchum's case, that's not the board's fault. It's not uh, my fault. That's on him. And that's why I object, is because he chose to take the extra case. And I don't think a continuance is appropriate, especially considering the action that the uh, Council took two weeks ago to uh, not renew the chief's contract. So, or not have a contract, not to reappoint him. So, I guess that would be the basis of my objection is that time is definitely the essence here. We don't want this to drag on in the new year. Again, questions or discussion by the safety board? 
Is there a motion regarding the request? I said, so was there a motion regarding the request to continue? You probably need to vote either to grant it or deny right. it. So somebody needs to make a motion one way or the other. I'll make a motion to deny the request. Brooke made a motion to deny the request to continue. Is there a second? I'll I'll second. Kathy seconds. All in favor? Opposed? No abstain. Should there be those? Probably, because you're the alternate for that you case. You abstained a quorum of the board voted in favor of it. Can you raise your voice? This is the hard time. Can you just get closer to the microphone? Yeah. You abstained a quorum of the board voted the way that it did, so that's enough to where Earl doesn't need to participate in that particular situation. Okay. All right, so I believe that concludes the regular um, portion of it. We'll go ahead and um, call the, the session um, for the purpose of the hearing, for the purpose of hearing evidence as to Lieutenant Ryan Geyser with respect to the three charges referred to this board by the presenting attorney, Anthony J. Saunders. The board will determine whether there is sufficient evidence presented to, to it to support those charges against Lieutenant Geyser, and if such a determination is made in the affirmative, what, if any, discipline the board would impose on Lieutenant Geyser. The procedure that the board will follow will be following tonight will be that as set forth in the rules of the procedure of the board that the board has previously adopted and has clarified below. The hearing will begin with the presenting attorney presenting his witness and his evidence to the board. The presenting attorney will conduct direct examination of the witnesses that he calls. Lieutenant Geyser's attorney will be, be allowed to cross-examine the witness and then the parties will redirect and recross-examine the witnesses as necessary. Following the conclusion of the presenting attorney's evidence, Lieutenant Geyser's attorney will present his witnesses, his witnesses and evidence and the attorneys will follow the same procedure for witness testimony as during the presenting attorney's case. Should either attorney object to the witness's evidence, questions, or testimony, then the objecting attorney will be able to make his argument in favor of the objection. The opposing counsel will be able to make his argument in favor of the witness, evidence, questions, or testimony, and then the board will conduct a roll call vote with three votes to sustain the objection required to sustain such, such an objection. Uh, the roll call vote will, will go as follows. Brooke Leffing will go, will go first as vice president. Kathy Pelser will go second as the senior um, board member. Shirley will go third, and then Aaron Leffingwell will go um, last. I will cast the uh, split vote in cases where there's a two-to-two -two decision. For this matter, there, there will be what is known as a separation of witnesses. This means that witnesses other than the parties will not be allowed in the same room at the same time. Any witness who is in the gallery once testimony begins will be disqualifying from, testimony, from testifying. No witnesses are allowed to discuss their testimony with each other or with anyone else, or listen to the live stream prior to testifying. If a witness discusses his or her testimony with anyone prior to presenting to it, Prior to presenting it to the board, that witness will be disqualified from testifying. Once a witness has testified and the parties agree that the witness will no longer be required to testify on any matters, then the witness can either remain in the room or leave the proceeding as the witness prefers. The public who are observing this hearing are admonished that this is not a meeting where the public is allowed to or has a right to participate. This is an administrative proceeding similar to that which is found in the court of law. The public is reminded to conduct themselves as if they were in a court of law. If they do not, if they do not do so, they will not be. They will be required to leave. Outburst or unsolicited remarks or any attempt to disrupt the proceedings will result in ejectment from the proceedings and could result in further consequences. At this time, I will turn it over to Attorney Saunders. Excuse me. I have a motion to dismiss that I would like to file and orally argue on before any further proceedings take place in this matter, please. You can file it. The motion speaks for itself. I received this five minutes ago and I had time to form any type of legal argument against it. So the court would be 
uh, board has two choices. They can either deny the motion outright or take it under advisement pending the proceedings themselves. Can you proceed to the right? Once again, I'm going to remind the audience that this is not a meeting where you participate. She said it's over here. The court reporter can request the audience to remain quiet. Bridget, it's the first warning. Did you hear me that time? I did, yes. Okay. I would like to file it and give you copies of it so that you can look at it before you make a decision on whether or not you want or argue on it at this time, please. Sure. I have this marked as Respondents Exhibit A. We're using the alphabet for my exhibits per the instructions of the court reporter. For the record, then, if that would be the ruling of the board, 
uh, we would make an offer to prove with respect to what our evidence would be if we would be allowed to ask questions of three particular board members, Curtis Ward, Brooke Leffingwell, and uh, the third citizen who has been appointed uh, to this particular board. We believe that there are potential conflicts of interest with respect to all three. And if permitted, I would ask my uh, client and respondent to summarize quickly what the evidence would show in terms of those conflicts of interest which we believe possibly exist in this matter. And they can do that at the beginning of their presentation. So we would move to take the motion to dismiss under advisement. If that's what you would Or to do. accept the motion to dismiss. Yes, whichever you want to do. He effectively named three people, so if he's intending to dis her question is, can we make a motion if we've been named in this? He's named three out of the five members of the safety board. Yeah, you can't try to balance all the safety board members like this, so no. He can make his proffer, and then if they seek to appeal to the circuit court, then they can do so, and they can show that based on their proffer, they thought there was conflict. But until you're bounced off the board or an actual conflict arises or is exhibited, you know, until then it's just a fishing expedition that they're not allowed to do. So you can, you can make whatever motion you want. Okay. Uh, I'm going to uh, place a formal objection for the record. I note for the record that the town attorney who regularly represents the interests of the town council, at least, is not present in this room to give legal advice. And the members of this public safety board are looking over to opposing counsel for his legal advice. I would submit that as a conflict that should not be allowed any further in terms of opposing counsel trying to act as the presenter prosecutor of the charges and at the same time giving out legal advice to the public safety board in the absence of the town attorney who would be the normal person to give you legal advice on procedures. The town attorney recused himself in this matter because his, his partner was one of the defense or defense attorneys. We retain Mr. Saunders to represent the town safety board in this particular interest. Then how can he also at the same time be the presenter of the charges as at the same time acting as your attorney? I object to that as being ethically impossible under the canons of ethics for attorneys to be representing you and at the same time being the the presenter of the evidence. That is a conflict of interest under the rules of professional conduct of the Indiana Supreme Court. No, it's not. 
So for the record, you are also acting as their attorney for the Public Safety Board at the same time you're presenting the evidence. Is that correct? I am presenting the evidence and it's my job to advise them of the law. They're the ones who have to make a decision, not me. And if you want to talk about conflicts, let's talk, let's talk about you representing two clients with a diametrically opposed testimony that you'll be presenting because I have a feeling based upon what I've been informed of by Tim Denby that your clients can say Terry was at the threatened Carl Hammer arrest and Terry's gonna say he wasn't. There's no uh, you can talk, you can judge my evidence in any way you deem fit before it's introduced, but you're wrong. So there's a motion to dismiss on the table. The board can take this under advisement, choose to grant the motion, or choose to reject the motion. made a motion to take the motion to dismiss under advisement till we hear the witnesses. Is there a second? Mm. Motion. I'll second. Aaron seconds. All in favor? Opposed? Attorney Saunders? Yes. I believe you're up. Uh, one great matter, I would uh, ask the board to take notice of the charges that were previously filed in this matter and all attachments there to my, uh, my first witness would be Christopher here again. To me, there are two, 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 two. At, Yeah, at this point in time, if you are, Attorney for Franklin County, prosecuting attorney, 37th Judicial District. And how long have you been the elected prosecutor there? Uh, I became the elected prosecutor on January 1st, 2019. Okay. And how long did you work at the prosecutor's office before that? I worked at the Franklin County Prosecutor's Office starting on January 1st, 2012. Prior to that, I worked at the Hamilton County, Ohio Prosecutor's Office. Well, I was Chief Deputy Prosecutor here starting in 2012. Prior to that, I was an assistant prosecuting attorney at the Hamilton County, Ohio prosecutor's office. Uh, I officially started as a prosecutor in January of 2007 until December 31st of 2011. Prior to that, I, I worked there as an intern from my third year of law school until when I was sworn in as prosecuting attorney. Okay. <clears throat> Your mic on. Oh, Thanks. sorry, it was on. Uh, did, did you pick all that up? Or did you... um, as a prosecuting attorney for Franklin County, uh, you had occasion to. We well, had several occasions to interact with Officer Ryan Dyson, is that correct? Yes. Okay. And in a hearing on July 19th of this year, uh, Officer Geyser offered some testimony in a uh, suppression hearing, is that correct? Yes. Okay. And it, 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 it involved events that have occurred between January 28th and January 30th of 2020. 
2022, is that correct? <clears throat> I, I think so. Okay. I think it may have been January 26th. It was a Wednesday through a Sunday. Okay. <clears throat> That's fine. And it involved uh, two, two defendants, a uh, Trevor Dahlheimer and uh, Garrett Peters, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And I'm going to show you what has been marked as plaintiff's exhibit one, which is the attachment to the charging information. Do you recognize that document? I do. The first two pages of that are a letter that she wrote to the town board. Is that correct? <clears throat> yes, a confidential letter. Okay. And in that letter, you stated that uh, essentially you would not um, rely upon filing criminal charges where the evidence was investigated in the courts for affirmation of Lieutenant Geisel. Is that correct? Right? That's correct. Okay. And from the time you wrote that letter to now, have you changed your mind on that? <coughs> no, I have not. Is that it's still your position? It is. Okay. Now, after the first two pages, there's a lengthy document called transcript. Is that a transcript you received from the court of that hearing on July 19, 2022? Yes, um, I, re I believe we requested a transcript under the cause number for Mr. Pierce. Um, I think either that day or the day after the hearing, we received the, the official transcripts from the court reporter uh, roughly two weeks later. Okay, and that's a two and a half copy of the document that you received, is that correct? That is. Okay. I move to admit uh, plaintiff's one. No objections, Your Honor. Okay. So, one of the things that you mentioned in this letter is that the manner in which you testified and some of the statements that he testified to uh, were inaccurate and raised credibility concerns. Is that correct? They raised credibility concerns, yes. Okay. And the, the document, uh, the transcript speaks for itself about what was said, but as we all know, words on paper don't look any different than their shouted, whispered, or spoken spoke normally. Is there anything about uh, Lieutenant Gowers' demeanor in that hearing? That um, in my opinion, during the course of that hearing, um, his demeanor certainly shifted. Um, early, early in the hearing, I mean, he see he did not he did not show up. He may have been subpoenaed, so he was late. Um, in my opinion, it, there was there were basic measures it, at first. I mean, he was confronted with questions from the, um, the, the parties that called him. Um, and at some point during the hearing, it, it appeared, at least from where I sat, that it began to dawn on him that, you know, what it was, you know, that there were, how do I put this? Um, it began to dawn on him that we knew more than, than he thought we knew, at least in my opinion. Now, you've been a prosecutor for quite some time, Rexing's an attorney great deal of trial experience, reading witnesses, knowing what the meaning means, right? Yes. Okay. And so you feel like things kind of fell apart, right? From his perspective? Mm -hmm. from, from my observations, yes. Okay. And in fact, because of his testimony uh, and the way out here, you had dismiss, you felt compelled to dismiss those charges, correct? Well, it, it, I first, <clears throat> after the testimony that, that was elicited, um, I, I was compelled. I, I no longer um, felt like I was in a position to oppose the motion to suppress. Um, there were statements from Geyser um, early in the hearing that were later directly contradicted under oath. Um, you have to read the transcript speaks for itself. But at that point, the, the hearing was based on a search warrant. The, the defendants had sought to suppress a search warrant, which is 
Gazer's sworn order. And after what I had just observed and what was in, in the direction of the testimony, I could not in good conscience and maintain any credibility of the court or to do my job, which is to seek justice. I could no longer um, support the, the court moving forward on that search warrant um, based on Gazer's testimony. It came out at that hearing. Therefore, I, I joined the motion to suppress, and the effect of the motion to suppress is the exclusion of all evidence. And at that point, with no real evidence, I was compelled to do nothing but dismiss the case. I had nothing to go for. And as a prosecutor, you have different obligations from defense attorneys. For example, you're required by two Supreme Court decisions to disclose all exculpatory evidence, correct? That's correct. And you were also required to divulge any uh, evidence you may have regarding the credibility of any witnesses the state may call, correct? Yes, those would be the Brady Julio case, and there's also the Indiana Rule of Professional Conduct, I believe 3.8, um, where, where I'm also compelled to disclose all unfavorable evidence to prosecution. Yeah, and so going forward, any time you would have to call Officer Geiser, to testify or any time an over information or a report he generated was made in a case, you would have to disclose to the defense counsel that there was this issue of credibility in this uh, Pierce suppression hearing, correct? Yes, those disclosures in fact have already been made. And that is what, yeah, okay, I was gonna get there. But, so you already have to disclose to any attorney where Officer Geiser is the, uh, officer the charges are based upon, correct? <clears throat> well, any charge in which he's been listed as a witness for the state. Oh, okay. Um, so... Or any case, I should say, any case. And so because of that, you will no longer prosecute any criminal charges where he is the person on whose oath or affirmation you have to uh, rely to get the charges. Yes, if, if his credibility, if I need to rely on his credibility, um, to support charges, I, I cannot get faith prosecuted. Okay, that's all I have. May I proceed? You yeah. may. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Herkan, how long have you known my client professionally? It would have been whenever he started, I think, with the Sheriff's Department. My Best recollection is that I think he probably started actually, I think he began as a jail officer there. Um, in terms of when he actually maybe started turning in case reports um, and appearing, I guess when he got his, when he got his badge, or probably around 2014. A number of years then. Yes. And have you had the opportunity to work with him directly or indirectly on many criminal cases in your role as a deputy prosecutor or prosecutor? Oh, yes. And how would you categorize up until the case that is in this hearing today the professionalism of Officer Geiger? Well, I'm not sure I understand the question. I mean, professionalism is a pretty, is a pretty broad... Have you ever had any problems with him prior to this case? What do you mean by problems? Cases that you had to dismiss, or you joined with defense attorneys on suppression hearings for? I no, I have never in my career joined a suppression hearing after hearing testimony in an officer. Have you ever had an occasion? Prior to this, prior to this, I've never done that. Uh, in fact, in 2020, didn't you write a letter to the town praising the professionalism of my client? I did. And what did you say in that letter about the professionalism of my client? I, I think I have to see a letter. I wrote it in 2020. If I recall, it was following um, we got a guilty verdict in a drug dealing case. Now that was a case that he worked when he was with the sheriff's department, and it went to trial. I think in late January of 2020. I remember because it was the last trial we were able to have um, before things got weird two years ago. But um, it, at least in that particular case, I. I, I guess you could say he exhibited professionalism. Did you have any doubts about his credibility as a police officer in any case that you can recall 
prior to the one in this hearing. Not, in particular, not as far as his credibility was concerned. No, I didn't, I didn't. There were no cases that I can recall off the top of my head in which I, I thought that perhaps he, he was misleading or being dishonest to me. Have you had an opportunity to know my client personally? I have. And can you describe by summary the nature of that personal contact? Well, I mean, you know, he has... I think at least one of his kids is in my kid's class, you know, in primary school. So, and, and I've watched him come up as an officer. So, yeah, I guess you could say, uh, do we socialize together or anything like that? No. Would we see each other, you know, at, at maybe school pickup? Sure. Isn't it true that normally you make it a practice to confer prior to the day of the officer's testimony at trial or at a suppression hearing to discuss the case that is going to be dealt with the, the following day or days in the suppression or jury trial or next trial? It depends. Not always. But is it a frequent practice on your part? Depends on the case. Okay. You didn't do that in this case, did you? You didn't ask to speak to Officer Geiser prior, uh, days prior to this actual suppression hearing, did you? By, by what means, sir? Telephone, email, text mail. Did you have any uh, conference with uh, the officer in terms of preparing for this suppression hearing that you testified to? Well, I, I know I would see. I, I spoke to him the morning after he made that arrest. Um, that Monday morning, I think nine o'clock, right away, I asked him about why 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 a rape arrest was made, um, and we had a brief conversation about that um, several times. I, I think I brought emails with me. I think during while this case was pending, there were several emails, several emails that I had communication with him about this case, and then I think. Even though he was called as a defense witness, my office sent him a subpoena. Um, well, I think he was saying more than one subpoena. The hearing was moved at defense request a few times. So no, I wouldn't say that I didn't communicate or confer with him. So he in fact cooperated with you in the preliminary stage before the suppression hearing? He responded. I think he responded to every email. He took my call on that Monday morning. Okay. Well, actually, I, I sent him a text and then he called me in directly afterwards. All right, now in terms of the day of the suppression hearing, uh, why didn't you ask for a continuance with the judge to confer uh, with uh, Officer Geyser uh, before he took the witness stand? judge was not happy that Officer Geyser was not there pursuant to a subpoena. And he was subpoenaed by the defense as well. He was called by the defense as a witness. As you can see from the transcript, I did everything I could to give him time to get there. I was concerned that perhaps Officer Gazer was going to be held in contempt for, for disregarding the subpoena. So there was no time, there was no time to confer. It, it is also, from my experience, if Officer Gazer was subpoenaed at a hearing, that he would arrive early. He did not. Now, something happened here where it changed from a suppression hearing called by the defense attorneys and you started interrogating your own police officer witness in your own criminal case here. Why did that happen? I was trying to find out the truth. My job as prosecutor, I don't have clients. My client is justice. And my job as prosecutor is to try to determine what the truth of the situation is and then do justice based on what the truth is. The questions that I asked were based on answers that I heard in previous testimony when Officer Geyser was called as a defense witness. And those led me to have questions of my own. And I pursued the, I pursued the truth and justice through those questions as I saw fit. Since 2014, sir, how many times have you taken that approach at a suppression hearing? I, I, you know what, I'm afraid, I don't know that I can answer that question because depending on your view of a particular case, you might have a different opinion on whatever my approach was. 
So since 2014, I don't know that I've ever had it happen in the suppression hearing where an officer has changed his testimony so dramatically. How many times have you joined in with the defense attorney's motion to suppress evidence like you did in this case? Never in my career. So this was the first and only time that you ever joined in with the defense attorneys taking the defense attorney's position that suppression was the appropriate remedy. I don't know that I took their position for the reasons that they stated. My position was that following Geiser's testimony, and as I, as I explained with these several inconsistencies and contradictions, I could not maintain, maintain my credibility with the court or live up to my responsibilities as a prosecutor if I argued against the suppression of that search warrant. The search warrant was the subject of the hearing. It was based on Geiser's affirmations under oath. And in light of the, what had just been elicited under oath, I simply could not, in good faith, in good conscience, and maintain any credibility with the court and make any other decision other than to join the motion to suppress. And you made all of those decisions without conferring with my client right there in the courtroom, spontaneously, making the decision to join with the defense attorneys to suppress the evidence, and you went beyond that and dismissed the case, correct? Well, sir, as you probably know, if the evidence in a drug case, if the evidence is suppressed, you don't have a case. So there's nothing, there's nothing to go forward on. I had no other choice but to dismiss. When, when the motion to suppress was granted by the court. In this case, did you bother to look at the case file to see if maybe there was an admission uh, by one of the defendants in terms of possessing illegal drugs? Well, it, sir, it, if, if the search warrant that led the officers to recover the illegal drugs was suppressed, or the fruits of that search warrant were suppressed, those drugs are no longer admissible as evidence. Regardless of, regardless of whatever admissions those suspects would have made subsequent to the execution of the search warrant, they would not be admissible. In this particular case, there was a search warrant that was obtained by Officer Geiser in front of a Franklin County judge, correct? As far as I know, yes. And did you have any evidence that the search warrant was invalid? Yes. What was the evidence? Geyser's testimony at the suppression hearing. Okay, now. Well, you know what, I'm actually invalid. Well, at the time, no. At the time, when I first reviewed it, no. Okay. When did you, quote, discover that the search warrant was invalid, in your opinion? After Geyser, after Geyser had completed his testimony. Even though the judge had issued the search warrant agreeing with Geyser's position? The search warrant did not contain Geyser's testimony at the suppression hearing. Okay. Are you accusing my client of lying on the witness stand in this suppression hearing? If so, exactly what is the lie? Sir, the, the transcript speaks for itself. I don't see any lie in there, do you? Well, you, if you want to characterize it as a lie, which one? I don't see a lie anywhere in the transcript. I reviewed it multiple times. You have too. What is the lie in your opinion? Can I have a moment of some minutes? Certainly. Well, what do you, sir, before I answer your question, could you clarify what you mean by a lie? You need a definition for what constitutes a lie? Well, what, what would you characterize as a lie? So I can answer your question most appropriately. Well, go to the English dictionary. Falsehood, not the truth. Well, I think if you, I think the most obvious, the most obvious one would be, if you have the, the transcript, um, when, when your client was uh, under direct examination from Tallheimer's attorney, um, your client specifically stated that Officer Donald Forsey asked him to arrest Trevor Tallheimer for the specific charge of rape. Um, subsequently, after 14 pages of testimony, 
Um, your client then stated, in fact, it was Chief Mitchell that ordered him to arrest and lodge, and lodge to honor on rape charges. Um, during that same exchange, he then specifically said it was not Forsey, despite earlier saying it was Forsey that, ordered, that, that told him to make that arrest. Um, during redirect examination by Tallheimer's attorney, he then clarified and said he arrested Tallheimer at the direction of Chief Terry Mitchell on the day of the execution of the search warrant. The two things, the two things, both things, in, in my opinion, uh, both can't be true. Uh, can you re uh, say that one more time? What, what are the two conflicting statements that constitute the lie? So I don't know which one of those is the lie. I just know that both can't be true. And what page are you referring to in terms of the conflict, alleged conflicting statements? Um, the, the first series of those would be on pages 27 through 29, and that would be under direct examination from Mr. Tallheimer's attorney. Um, then there's a lot of there, there's a lot of context that the reader uh, of the transcript um, should not ignore. Then when I cross-examined him, again, uh, your client was not called by me as a witness. Um, on page 41 and 42, your client specifically states that in fact it was Chief Mitchum that ordered him to arrest Tom. At first, he tried to say it was a mixture, then he went then he changed his story completely, and then it was no, it was the chief. Um, and then again, he clarified that under redirect examination by Mr. Tallheimer's attorney, that it was the chief and not Officer Fulson. Now, sir, this was a suppression hearing with respect to the service of the search warrant and the collection of the drug evidence. What does anything you just said have to do with that? Well, credibility is always, always an issue for an officer, specifically an officer whose search warrant, his affirmations in a search warrant affidavit were the basis of the judge authorizing the search. So the fact that your client gave two diametrically opposed answers that can't be true puts his credibility at issue. Therefore, is basically at the center of a suppression hearing that's based on his affirmations in a search warrant affidavit. What difference does it make who ordered him to arrest what? I, in a suppression hearing for drug evidence. I think what matters is the fact that your client gave two directly conflicting answers. And they can't both be true. And if you read the totality of the transcript, it's very clear that your client, at least in my opinion, knew that he wasn't giving it correct, that one of those wasn't true at the time he gave that answer under oath and open court. And the, and the variance has to do with who ordered the arrest? Yes. Is it possible that he might have forgotten who ordered the arrest? I don't know. I don't know. That calls for speculation. He doesn't know who said well, this one is just calling a lie. I mean, you can forget something, and that can be the basis for the uh, alleged conflicting statement. In the uh, charge, official account number one, uh, it refers to uh, your information, and uh, it, it doesn't refer to those two conflicting statements. Do you know why? I didn't prepare the charges, sir. I can't explain. <clears throat> I, in fact, I don't even have them in front of me. Uh, when you wrote a letter to the town complaining about this, did you mention those two conflicting statements? No. At all? The letter speaks for itself. <clears throat> and it is your testimony that that's the entire basis of your complaint against Officer Geiser? No. There's no more. All right, well, what else is the basis for your complaint against Officer Geiser? Well, there wasn't simply, the, there was also the fact that when first <clears throat> confronted with, by the, by the defense attorney, well, by the, the attorney that called him, with whether or not he, he made it, he had a communication with him, at least Whittemore, um, he claimed not to recall it. But 
Um, it was only after he was confronted with a tangible phone record that that call took place that he began to acknowledge that that call did in fact occur or that the communication occurred. And in my opinion, based on the remainder of the testimony, especially considering police actions that he admittedly had never undertook in his career, it was very, it was very hard to believe that when he gave that answer that he did not recall uh, speaking to at least Woodmore, um, at least in my opinion, it, based on the totality of everything I heard that day, um, that was at best evasive. Um, let's see. There was also, for the very first time, and he later reiterated in testimony, on page 33, um, your client testified that Chief Mitchum was involved in the execution of the search warrant arrest. Um, however, I reviewed your client's case report. Um, he never once mentioned Chief Mitchum being involved in his case report, although he gave detailed descriptions as to where Officer Williams was during the whole encounter. Um, further, there, I, I checked the dispatch records and Chief Mitchum was not listed on those as being at that search warrant execution. Um, so that was the first time throughout that, based on the report, that, I, that anyone would have known that Chief Mitchum um, was there. <clears throat> and what relevancy does that have, whether or not another officer was present? Who cares? It, in light of everything else, uh, I found it to be relevant. You're very emotional about this matter, aren't you? No, I'm just going to make sure everyone can hear. No, you're very emotional about the entire objections you have against uh, the officer here, aren't you? I'm not sure I, under I'm not sure I understand your question. No, okay. Let's go over the high level of emotion that you exhibited in this case. Number one, you exhibited immediately during the suppression hearing the willingness to immediately join defense attorneys in their initiated motion to suppress evidence, correct? Correct. You also, not only stopped there, but you dismissed immediately without conferring with anybody the criminal case at the same hearing as well, correct? Yes, and I have the discretion to make that decision myself. And then you, you shortly thereafter filed a letter of complaint with the town of Brookville against Officer Geiser? I, is that what you're, are you talking about my letter that's attached to the charges? Yes. Well, I sent that in, I believe the date that that was sent was um, late November perhaps, so okay. four months, at least four months after the hearing. So we did follow it with that? Yes. And then was there a time when you called for a special prosecutor to investigate my client? Yes. Why did you do that? Because of, well, because of what I had just heard in the hearing, as well as all the other circumstances, I, I felt I was potentially a witness, um, and therefore, to avoid the appearance of impropriety, and as you know, a prosecutor can be a witness in his own case, I felt that it was incumbent upon me, uh, based on the rules of professional conduct, and my special responsibilities as a prosecutor, um, to see special prosecutor to investigate this. Since being a prosecutor since 19, until 2014 on to the president, how many times have you asked for a special prosecutor against a police officer? Well, I wasn't, I wasn't the, well, I wasn't the elected prosecutor in 2014. Or, or deputy prosecutor. I, that wasn't his deputy prosecutor, that was not a call for me to make. Okay. I, I do believe my superior officer or my, that Mr. Law, my predecessor, I, I can think of at least one or two. I mean, in terms of, in my term as prosecutor, I, I don't recall it. I think this is the only time that I have. Okay. And did you cooperate with that special prosecutor? Absolutely. Well, cooperate. I never met or really spoke to the special prosecutor about this case. Uh, you, at some point in time, the special prosecutor, after completing his... Well, let me clarify. Let me clarify. When the special prosecutor was appointed, 
I made a brief phone call just to, to brief him on what type of case. But after that, until he filed his report, I never spoke to him at all. Directly. And what was the findings of the neutral, objective special prosecutor concerning your claims against my client? I think those are filed in a public record with the circuit court. And what were they? What were the results? Um, I don't have it in front of me. I, my understanding is that he chose not to pursue formal criminal charges. So you shared with this special prosecutor all of your concerns. You called for a special prosecutor to investigate everything involving my client and your objections to this, what he said and did at the suppression hearing. And this special prosecutor decided no charges will be filed against my client. You have to ask him what his concerns were. I never shared my concerns with him. I turned over evidence to the state police. Okay. You shared, you did have a telephone call with the special prosecutor as you testified. Very good. Summarizing what you were concerned about. I, I just gave him, it was a very, very brief one night, so he, which is kind of a courtesy, but that was it. And then the rest of the evidence, I turned over to the Indiana State Police investigator. And so the Indiana State Police looked into your case against my client. The special prosecutor supervised the Indiana State uh, Police investigation of your reason for having the special investigator in the first place, and they ruled against you. I object to that. That mischaracterizes evidence entirely and tries to make it look like it was Mr. Hewerkamp's case, when in fact all he did was request an investigation as he's required to do as prosecutor if he believes there's wrongdoing. It's not his case. He's not the client. He's not the client of the state police or of the special prosecutor. He had a concern. He stated it no more than any other citizen who uh, presents a complaint to the police. So that question mischaracterizes the evidence and the record. So if he wants to rephrase, fine. Otherwise, I object to the question. Would you like to rephrase? Oh, I'll, I'll rephrase the question. You were the one that requested the special prosecutor. Is that correct? Yes. You provided the special prosecutor with a quick summary of your concerns, correct? We didn't even characterize it that. It, it was simply a courtesy call and explaining who the state police detective was, what I met with him. And you forward any information that you had concerning my client to the Indiana State Police investigator? Yeah, I'm going to cross the street. And what were the results of this investigation by the special prosecutor? I don't know. I don't know what they what they determined in their conferences. I wasn't privy to those. I don't know what additional evidence they gathered. I don't know what went into the decision making. I was specifically I was, I was specifically I was bound to be excluded from all that. So in terms of what the result, I, I can't answer that. I can tell you. I, I don't know if the answer that you're searching for is in, a, is in an official court record. And that's the decision of the special prosecutor. It's our history court department. Now, why did you concede that the special prosecutor did not pursue criminal charges against the respondent? I'm sorry? I said I'll concede that the special prosecutor did not pursue criminal charges against the respondent. Thank you. We'll have that in the record then. Yes. Now, you didn't stop at asking for a special prosecutor and also dismissing the, the case based upon the search warrant. Now you are asserting that you will never, ever use this officer ever again as a witness in any case that you are involved with in criminal court. Is that correct? <clears throat> The water speaks for itself, sir. You're very emotionally charged against my officer, aren't you? No, not at all. How many times in your career as a prosecutor have you 
made that decision to never, ever use, ever again, in any criminal case where they might be a witness from that point. I don't think I've ever, had, I don't think I've ever been compelled to write a letter like this in, in the entire time that I've been a prosecutor. So this is the first time? Yes. This is the first time I've ever had to take this step. And you're doing this, even though the special prosecutor chose not to file charges after his investigation of the same matter that you're concerned about. Yes. So there's a debate among prosecutors, I take it. I, I don't know. I, <clears throat> I'm the prosecutor here in Franklin County. And my job, my obligation, is to see that justice is done here, and that the citizens can expect a fair administration of justice, and that the truth will be sought. Now, are you asserting that you cannot use this officer because of the U.S. Supreme Court decisions of Brady and Gigolo? Is that your reason for it, or is it a personal reason? I would object to this line of questioning. The prosecutor has absolute discretion, as do most lawyers, about who they can and will not use as a witness based upon the credibility concerns. The fact of the matter is, it doesn't matter why he made this decision, it just matters that he made this decision as to whether Lieutenant Geiser can continue to perform his duties fully as a law enforcement officer <coughs> in the Brookville Police Department, or quite honestly, for that matter, anywhere in Franklin County. So the question is irrelevant. Jackson's been noted. Any Objections been made to Warden's rule and again the response to his objection? Well, I think it's, it's relevant to the inquiry here. Uh, I think there's a reference in the charges that uh, uh, the prosecutor uh, will not be using uh, this officer, and the letter may in fact refer to Brady versus Maryland. The prosecutor's own letter refers to Brady versus Maryland and Giglio versus U.S. in his letter dated November 29, 2022. The letter speaks for itself. That's still a problem. Objections been made. Do the roll call. Um, how do you vote whether to sustain or to object the motion? Sustain. Captain. Sustain. Sure. Aaron. Sustain. Sustained. Motion sustained. <laughs> what is your understanding of using police officer witnesses in the courtroom with respect to Brady? <clears throat> Are you talking about just the Brady decision or yes. Brady and Julio and the Tiddy Well, I mean, Brady, the Brady decision states that. The, the failure of a prosecutor to turn over exculpatory evidence to a defendant is a violation of due process and, and, and can be cause for a reversal of conviction. Um, the Jiglio decision takes that a little bit further and requires prosecutors to disclose any instances of dishonesty, um, untruthfulness, inconsistent statements that are known to the prosecutor to the defense. Um, and then there's also the Kyles versus Whitley case that has to be done with or without a request. So taken together with the rules of professional conduct, it requires me to disclose to any defense attorney in which your client would be a witness this, this specific episode of, of what I characterize as dishonesty. And it could, you know, it, it, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll wait for the next question. Okay. And then that can be decided on a case-by-case -case basis when the police officer is required to testify in court and it's not plea bargained, correct? I'm not sure I understand your question. Uh, the material has to be provided when, number one, the officer is listed as a potential witness, and number two, there's, it has to be provided before the trial, and then obviously the defense attorneys can use it at trial when that officer testifies. Yes, they can. They, they, they can significantly impair, as I said earlier, the credibility of, of any witness, especially a police officer, is always an issue. So instances like this can be used to discredit his testimony on any case. Don't you think the 
fact that a special prosecutor chose not to file criminal charges would vindicate my officer and therefore not be a Brady violation? No. Why do you say that? Because in my opinion, as I said in my letter, throughout this entire interview, he exhibited himself dishonestly. Now you're saying he's dishonest during his entire testimony. Well, in general. I'll you mentioned allegedly two conflicting statements. I'm going to object to this line of questioning. The fact of the matter is he made the decision. It's his decision to make. If he wants to make the decision, he's entitled to do so. Any reason as to why he made it is not relevant. And arguing with the witness about whether he should have made the decision or not is not relevant to the proceedings today. The fact of the matter is that it was made. So any of this inquiry into why it was made is irrelevant. It can be a reasonable or it can be an unreasonable decision. His decision has an impact on the charges against my client, and I have the right to go into that. But the, the safety board is not set up to determine prosecutorial discretion. We don't weigh in on that. No, but my client is charged with one of the charges deals with his decision. And if I can show that his decision is unreasonable, unnecessary, that would go to the merit of the case. But is that something that you would show to the safety board? The safety board has no way in on what is reasonable and unreasonable in terms of how he conducts his office. He's an elected official. He's the chief enforcement agent of the county. The safety board does not oversee his discretion as a prosecutor. Well, he's the accuser against my client. I have the right to cross-examine the accuser. When it's relevant, he does. And the fact of the matter is, as well, that it doesn't matter whether the decision is reasonable or unreasonable. The effect of the decision is the same, whether it's reasonable, unreasonable, crazy, unfounded, or whatever. He has decided this is what he's going to do. That's all that matters. And if it's an unreasonable decision, even if the safety board said, well, gee, it's an unreasonable decision, he still can't fully function as a law enforcement officer in Franklin County because he won't do any criminal charges based upon his assertions in the letter. So it's irrelevant. And it's killing time trying to cause this to draw into another day, which was stated in the motion to continue as a reason to continue that case, is they're trying to delay. We're not trying to delay at all. This is a very serious accusation against my client. Can you restate your objection for the record? The objection is this entire line of questioning is irrelevant. Any questions into why the prosecutor exercised his discretion in this way is not relevant to these proceedings. Objection has been made. Roll call. Sustain or overrule? Sustain. Captain. Sustain. Shirley. Aaron. Sustain. Sustain. Do I have a moment to confer with my client just for a moment? Yes. Thank you. Did you, during the suppression hearing, ask questions of my client with respect to political matters? Oh, um, I believe, well, I, not just me, I think in the entire hearing, he let his opinions be known on certain political matters, specifically regarding Trevor Tuan. Um, I think he, I think your client on, um, on page 31, he first told counsel for Tuan, he just knew that Tuan wasn't a fan of law enforcement. Um, when he eventually acknowledged calling Lee Stormore for political reasons, um, after first learning not to remember that he even spoke to her, um, he knew this about went to someone else. And he did tell on page 32, um, Council Barrett, uh, that the goal of calling Elise Whittemore was to find someone to run against Trevor Tallman. So those are, is that what you're asking? Yeah. Those are the, the 
this or this question is going to be asked by me. This was asked by um, counsel who, who called uh, your client as a witness. I was cross-examining him. Did you make a statement to my client that politics and law enforcement as a combination are not a good mix in essence? What I did was, and let me... I guess I'm going to pick up this question to the interaction between the witness and the respondent is contained within the transcript. The transcript speaks for itself, so if those things are in there, that's fine. That's a closing argument, then not something to ask him. Did you say this at this time? The transcript speaks for itself. That evidence is in front of the board without uh, objection from the respondent. In fact, the matter is, this is just a way for them to kill time. So it is irrelevant to continue to ask him about what happened at the hearing. That records are for the court. It's immaterial to ask him why anything regarding the rule that have anything about why he made the decision he did. So I guess I'm objecting to relevance of what the uh, transcript says because it already says what it says. I would call the question, but I'm going to continuously strongly object. My client has a right to a full and complete hearing no matter how many days it takes. You are accusing me in our case of delaying tactics. I don't think it's appropriate to make that claim when the prosecuting attorney, one of the primary, one of the few witnesses that you are calling, uh, I'm cross-examining. It's not unreasonable to cross-examine one of the few witnesses you're calling, and it's one of the chief witnesses you're calling. I have no objection to cross-examination. When it's relevant and material to the fact of what we're trying to proceed to find, what we're trying to find is whether this witness at the prosecutor will, will take any evidence or information from Lieutenant Geiser, and that's what we're here to decide, whether it's a reasonable decision or not, it's a political issue, not an issue here. That's something that only he can answer to you as a noble believing the representative of the government in the state of Indiana, there's no one who can hold trust on his discretion uh, in these matters. So any inquiry beyond what the effect of his decision is, is it real? Well, I said I would do the question. Uh, sir, in this suppression hearing, uh, there was a reference to not only the drug case, which was he had a search warrant, but also a warrantless arrest for the crime of the rape. Is that correct? I <clears throat> guess I believe that was first raised by the attorney who called your client. In this particular situation, even though there was a warrantless arrest <clears throat> for rape, in at least indirectly related to this particular case, you still felt it was necessary to join in the suppression motion. I'm, I'm not sure I understand your question, sir. Could a dismissal in the drug case have an impact upon the warrantless arrest for rape? I'm not sure I know how to answer that question. Okay. I'm not, I'm not exactly. You do admit that there was an arrest for rape as well as uh, service of a search warrant? Your, your, client, yeah, your client admitted that he made a warrantless arrest for rape on an investigation that was not his at the same time. Yes. Okay. And what did you do with the rape case, if any? Similar investigation. And how long has it been under investigation? Since the investigating officer first tendered the preliminary report. Many months ago? I, and I'm not, well, yes, I mean, he, he tended, but at this time, there are no formal criminal proceedings are ongoing. In the case of rape, the statute of limitations, I believe, is eight years. But there, are no, there is no active. Now, was there a time when my client and his mother-in-law reported a theft of catalytic converters to your office? Not to my office, no. Okay. Did you become aware of a report of theft of catalytic converters to their property? Yes, yes. 
Well, that was that would be a case that that was reported to and investigated by the Franklin County Sheriff's Department. And have you filed charges on behalf of my client and his mother-in-law in regards to the theft of catalytic converters from their vehicles? I don't file charges on behalf of any private citizen. I file charges on behalf of the state of Indiana. And have you filed charges on behalf of the state of Indiana in regards to this matter? Is it? I'm going to need some clarification. Who's the suspect? Zachary Burkhart. Oh, I did. Yes, I did file charges in that case. That was, those were charges filed among several charges, though. The, the least serious offense, at least in terms of potential criminal uh, <clears throat> penalty, was the fact that the catalytic converts. Yes, charges were filed in that case. Was there a time when you used my client as a police officer witness in a criminal case after the events that you had testified to in this hearing? After, after, after the last suppression hearing, we dismissed the case. Oh, he had, yes, he had to testify, I think, at a suppression hearing <clears throat> in the Stephen Lake's case. But in that case, there was a uh, there was a full confession from the suspect. And also, you had to testify, you called him to testify. I did not personally, my, my chief deputy actually was primary in that case. Okay. And was used as a witness on behalf of the state? I, I was at, there was a motions hearing, a, a pretrial motions hearing, and he was called as a witness. Um, and I don't, I, I did not sit in on the trial, so I don't know, off the top of my head, I would have to ask her, I don't know if he was actually called as a witness at trial or not. Would it be, do you know if it was a case that resulted in a conviction after he testified? I don't know if he didn't say that he testified or not. He doesn't know that question, so he can't possibly answer it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, did you write a news release about that successful case that my client testified to after the conviction? I think that's just that. He can know whether or not he wrote a press release. But you said that he wrote a press release after the conviction where your client testified. But you said he doesn't know whether your client testified. I'm asking about the press release. You asked, you, you no, I'm asking about the press release. Would you care to rephrase your question for the record? Yeah. Did she issue a press release after that conviction? <clears throat> yes, I did. Do you remember the content of the press release? Um, off the top of my head, I don't have it in front of me, but <clears throat> that was an interesting case because the trial was actually conducted in absentia. The defendant failed to appear. Um, the court issued a warrant. In fact, he was just recently apprehended in Texas to a lot of fanfare. Um, in that particular case, the suspect, the defendant, who was been convicted in his awaiting sentencing, gave a full videotaped confession. Um, and I don't, I wasn't in the trial, so I don't know the extent of whether or not the client testified at all in that, but his credibility had absolutely no bearing on that case because there was a full and complete confession um, that was given by the defendant. And that was actually recorded, it was on video, and as far as I know, the jury did observe and, and watch that video and take that into account. What about the issue of testimony that she had to be, despite what she just said, did Ask my client to become a witness. I would object to that. He said he doesn't know who he testified. I, I, I know he testified. I'll answer. I know he testified in a, in a pretrial motion hearing because I actually observed that hearing. I, I did not observe him testify at trial. And you would have to get the transcript to, to know whether or not he testified in the witness stand. And I haven't reviewed that. Is there anything that my client could do that you could think of as the prosecuting attorney that could change your opinion about never using you again in the future as an officer? I don't know if I know how to answer that, sir. 
That's a, that's a fairly broad question. Is your decision not to use my client as an officer permanent, unchangeable, or are there conditions in your own mind that you might consider that would allow him to once again, with your approval, to become a witness in future criminal cases? I don't approve a witness. I only subpoena them and make a decision on them. I, I don't know if I know how to answer that. I, I think in my letter, and I stand by it until further notice. That's the only way I think I know how to answer So it is possible that uh, in the future you could change your mind about not using my client as a witness? I seriously am expecting it. I, I don't know. I don't know. If you don't know, then... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know, sir. Uh, I mean, I you're don't. saying I don't know, so I don't know means it's possible. I suppose, I suppose anything's possible, but I, I, but no, it's hard to get it. Redirect. You, you uh, remain with the position that you stated in the letter today, correct? I do. Is that going to change in the next week, month? I, I can't imagine how. Okay. Um, you stated you discussed the war on the Supreme Court last week. We took a guy to leave that on Monday, is that correct? I did. How did he respond? How was his attitude? It was a phone call, mm -hmm. so I didn't see his face. Um, <clears throat> I don't want to say he chuckled or he laughed, but <clears throat> my impression was, <clears throat> sorry, it was for a month now. Um, it was on the day. I, when I saw, we don't get it, thankfully, we don't have a lot of rape arrests in Brookville, certainly not ones that the prosecutor doesn't know about in advance. Um, so when I saw that there had been an arrest made for that charge, for that particular person, um, by Geyser, who I knew was not the investigator on the previous report, is what I'll call it, um, I, my first inclination was to think that perhaps there was, there was a new accusation. Um, so I sent him a text message and asked him, I wanted to talk to him immediately. I think I sent him at 9 a.m. on a Friday. Or a Monday, pardon me. He called me, either I called him or he called me soon after we talked. <clears throat> and um, the impression that I got, and again, this was over a phone call, was that he thought it was kind of cute. Okay. And that's, that's my impression. I don't know if he felt that way or not. But that was certainly the impression that I had after that call. And that was on, I think, January 3rd. That's all I have. Nothing further. Where's your seat, folks? Outside. Go get Please. Please. Witness is excused, and I'm releasing him from this subpoena. Yes. Can be excused. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.